Good evening. This uh, shiur will be Lerfuat uh, Daniel Ben Chana Ila Bat Esther and Chaim uh, Yuda David Ben Victoria Mordechai Ben Boba and uh, Victor Morales and Lavdi Leilui Nishmat Shmuel Baruch Ben Shimon and Leilui Nishmat Dvora Bat Mercedes. Tov, Baruch Hashem, I'm back from Israel. I already spoke last Tuesday in, uh, in uh, Brooklyn. Oh, one more name, I forgot, sorry. And also, Latzlacha of Liora Bat Avraham. It's our birthday tonight. Vrat Hashem, life full of happiness. As you know, I was away in Eretz Israel, and I had a very productive trip. And Bezrat Hashem, in two weeks I'm going again to Israel. I was in the meantime in LA. My Canada trip is postponed because the, the Canadian government closed the border. I mean, the, all the gathering, it's not possible to do a lecture there. I was supposed to be also in, uh, in Maryland. This was also postponed. You never know what can happen. You can make plans. What a shame, I have plans to go to Israel in two weeks. If, if I go, I go. If not, we'll continue as usual. If not, next Monday I'm still here. That's what's important. We take it week at the time. Baruch Hashem, I have a friend. He's in the Israeli Knesset. He speaks there almost every day. Very, very traditional, becoming stronger in religion. I send him a lot of my videos. Yesterday, he published the speech, the best speech I think it was ever given in a Knesset was yesterday. Spoke against the lefties and the haters of the Torah, against the Arabs there. He had to see the lecture. It's not much, but all the lectures we gave here, it was in that lecture. Usually, you know how they scream. They don't let you talk, the lefties. There's one rule by them. If you disagree with them, they put you on a ban. They'll never let you say your opinion. Never. I'll give you an example. There's one woman, she married a Hasid Breslev. She herself is a lefty. Secular woman, lefty, Hasid Breslev, beard. What's the connection? I don't know. Only Hashem knows. Ask them, what's the connection? This woman is a serious leftist. So she made a show against uh, Bensi Gopstein. Or is an organization called Lehava, Flame. What do they do? They try to prevent intermarriage between Jewish girls to Arabs, which is a pandemic in Israel, a real pandemic. And there's no vaccine for it. There's no vaccine for it. So they try to help those teenagers. And you know, today when you try to avoid assimilation and try to stick to the Torah, immediately they label you as a racist. Even though it has nothing to do with racism. How many times you have to explain these fools? We follow the instruction of the creator of the world. It's nothing to do with who's better, who's not. Nothing to do with that. Anyway, so she wanted to do a show, and she said to Gopstein, which is an extreme right, I'm making a show about the two extreme sides, the left and the right. Would you agree to, to participate in a show? He said yes. She tried all the leftiest in Israel, Betzelem and all these poison organization in Machshimam Veshem Zichram, the biggest enemies of the Jewish nation, each one of them, complete, complete, complete traitor that bring destruction to our nation, cooperate with our enemies, destroying Israel from inside, a real cancer inside the state. Now one of them agreed to come on a show. Why? Because a religious right wing leader is going to be on the show, none of them agree to come. That's how they are. 
It's either our way or the highway. Nobody else will talk. There is no opinion of the right can be heard. Only the left. Same thing in America. Same thing everywhere in the world. If you have an opinion, if you want to say you're a supporter of Trump, you have to be afraid to say it. I'm also supporting Trump. Wow, God forbid someone in college heard that. That's how it goes here. You're afraid to say. You're afraid to say you're religious. You're afraid to say you support the right. You're afraid to say you support Netanyahu. You're afraid to say you support Republicans. You're Democrat, very good. You're lefty, very good. You're Bernie Sanders, very good. Anything else, anything that comply with the Torah, we're not interested. And that's what's happening right now, unfortunately. Today they say that Trump, he wants to run again in three years, less than three years. And they made a poll that is leading by far from all other Republican candidates. Nikki Haley, 4%. Trump, 55%. Uh, the governor of Florida, 11%. Mike Pence, 8%. All other leaders, 2%, all of them together. Trump alone, 55%. Few years ago, I would be very happy about these results. Who would want a better friend to Israel and to the Jews than Trump? But today it's a different story. I'm very worried if Trump is gonna get elected. Anybody Republican is better, why? Why? The answer is, it's full of anger and rage. And when he is angry at someone, you don't want to be in his target. First of all, he hates Netanyahu. He did not speak another word with him after he congratulated Biden. He said, it's finished by me. I had not spoke one word with him and will not speak with him again. And there's a chance Netanyahu will come back to power. If Trump is going to be, it's the end of us. Israel will become his enemy, unfortunately. Plus, he's very angry at the Jews in America. He's very angry at the Jews in America. How can he not be angry at them? They betrayed him again and again and again and spilled his blood on the media nonstop. And he's very upset. To the point that he said a week ago, the Jews betrayed Israel. They don't care about Israel. The Christians in America love Israel more than the Jews in America. I wish he was wrong. I wish he was wrong. I mean, you, when you hear the truth, as much as you hate it, you have to admit. cannot be a faker. Even if your enemies tell you the truth in your face, Make sure to admit, don't be a politician. Politicians say what's good for them. There's nothing to do with the truth. A kosher Jew is the exact opposite of a politician. Exact opposite. Whatever politicians do, you must do the opposite. They say what's good for them. They're going to come to the Palestinian, they will speak against Israel. They come to Israel, they will speak against the Palestinian within an hour. Two different speeches. Complete opposite. But no connection to the truth. You, as a kosher Jew, that you want to follow the, law, the laws of God, you have to first put the truth above all other considerations. Doesn't matter who said it. Lefty, righty, Jew, non-Jew, man, woman, young, uh, old, smart, stupid, doesn't matter. Let's analyze what was told. Is it true or not true? Remember, this is a very important, solid rule. What did you lose, Benji? <sighs> so, Remember what I told you. There's a rule, the Torah say, a person must be fearful from God, whether he is in the open, 
in public, whether it's in hidden rooms. Umodea la emet, always admit what's right and what's wrong. Udover emet bilvavo, and speak the truth also in your heart, meaning in your mind, not just on the open. Make sure that you adjust your mind to always align with the truth. Always. And that's the obligation of every one of us. Why? Because when Mashiach comes, one of the conditions to survive will be Sheerit Israel lo yasu avla ve lo yedabru kazav. Liars, deceivers, crooks, double-faced people will not be able to welcome the holiness of the Mashiach. If you know your crook, you better work on it right now. Start changing your nature. Uh, a lot of people, they do a lot of good things, but they have few critical problems that will destroy everything. If they won't work on those critical problems, they will end with a bitter feeling. When the, come, when the time comes, how will they be able to show their face knowing they steal, they cheat, they lie all day in a business, in their personal life. But they comfort themselves because they keep Shabbat and they give a lot of donations, which is very important. And I always say it, donations is one of the things that can save us from a lot of problems. It's higher than sacrifices in Bet HaMikdash, especially if you do it to the right place. If you donate it to a reform synagogue, you will be punished for every dollar, obviously. That's against Hashem. That's nothing to do with God. It's the exact opposite of what He wants. If you invest in idol-worshipping places, that's against God. If you invest on this hypocrite from Boca Raton who constantly push Christianity and keep bringing Christian missionaries into his, uh, into his supposedly orthodox synagogue to brainwash the Jews to become Christian, obviously, if you support something like that, that's not a mitzvah. Mitzvah is to support real orthodox, Yereshamayim people, Baruch Hashem, that follow the truth of the Torah. That's the mitzvah. Not to support all kinds of conservative and, 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 uh, and uh, reform and all kinds of other things. Bezrat Hashem, you should know that. Today I wanted to speak about a few interesting things before I actually get to the topic of the lecture. As you know, the world is now in a not clear situation. Another wave of Corona, and another wave, and another wave, and another wave. The vaccines don't get to help a lot of people. With the vaccines, they also get sick. Nobody knows what's going to happen. Maybe we're coming towards the end of the pandemic. Maybe the virus become weaker now. Maybe it's going to be another wave which will become more critical. We don't know. Nobody really knows. One thing I tell you now, that almost every person this week got sick. Everyone I spoke to is almost sick. And it's not only corona, it's also flu. So the point is, you know what happened when so many people become sick? They cancel thousands of flights every day. It's billions of dollars. Billions of dollars go to a waste every day because of that. That's number one. Number two, some people, they have critical problems, you know, in their health, they can, they, can, they can die. They can catch something that doesn't look so serious and it develop into a horrible thing. So that's one problem. The second problem is, the second problem is that the second problem is the things between the United States and China is escalating now. And it's going to affect Israel seriously. Why? Because the Americans do not know what to do with China. The Chinese are very powerful. The Chinese are very smart. 
the Chinese do not follow this nonsense of being politically correct. Nobody over there is afraid to do what's right. Nobody cares what the world would say. They don't have this gun to their head like here in America. Democracy, democracy, democracy. In the meantime, the country is destroyed. Same thing in Israel. Democracy, democracy, democracy. The enemies of Israel took over. Continue with this nonsense that your enemies keep telling you in your face, we won't rest until we slaughter all of you, and you continue to give them rights. Same thing over here, same thing in Europe a long time ago. In China, you don't have such thing. Your ideology is radical and dangerous to our belief. You're not going to make a beep in China. Now, one mask. No one is allowed to gather and pray. We don't want Islam over here. We're not going to make the same mistake the West did and Europe and United States and Israel and the rest of these stupid countries. Over here, nobody will make a beep. You're not going to speak to one person about your religion over here. That's why nobody, nobody's, nobody dare to mess with them. They have some Marines, they have serious army, they have very strong soldiers. And they have the best spying equipment in the world. Every phone in the world, every phone in the world, they're in it. Whether it's Apple, whether it's Android, every company in the world, they are in it. Every Air Force, they're in it. Inside the offices and the, and the computers of the most secret computers of the Israeli army, they are in it. For three years, they're attacking Israel with cyber every minute. I know from inside, I have friends inside. Every minute, they attack Israel. But at the same time that they steal all the secrets from all over the world, at the same time, what else they do? They buy real estate, and they buy companies, and they're occupying the world. Most of the money that the United States owe, they owe to China and to Japan. All this huge number that you see in Manhattan, I don't know if they still have it. They still have that long number? Probably got longer, another block, no? In Manhattan. Last time I saw it was 25 years ago. I don't ever try never to go to Manhattan. But the last time I saw it, it was a pretty long number. I assume now it has a few more zeros. This is almost all of it to China. Almost all of it. Imagine the interest you pay them. A few percent a year, whatever it is, on such number. No matter how much money you print, at one point will not be enough just to pay that interest. They bought very important companies in Israel until Trump put an end to it. Trump is clever. So what, what to the Israeli, what's wrong with you? You see a little bit extra money, 10, 15% more above the market price, and right away you run to sell them all the assets of Israel? You're out of your mind. They're going to own the most important businesses, communication company, phone companies. They're basically taking over your country without a war. And I want to tell you something you won't believe. You're not going to believe it. It's unbelievable how dirty this politics here. In 1986, some of you were not born yet. 1986, Israel developed a plane, combat. It's called the Lavi, similar to F-16. With Israeli technology, which is much more advanced than American technology. How do I know? I was in the Air Force. Every airplane used to come from America, F-16 or F-15. First thing the Israelis do, they open all the panels with the screws. They take all the American computers and all the electronic from inside, take it out, and replace it with Israeli equipment. For two reasons. One, it's better. And second, they don't trust the Americans. Everybody spies on everyone. They put spying equipment over there. 
Well, we're going tr we to trust your computer that you're going to follow what we do and how we train and what country we bomb. We do not want to take that risk. So they replace everything. Israel was about to manufacture that airplane, but they needed American money. But America not only did not want to give money, they threatened Israel. And if they continue to do it with another country, they're going to cut their annual budget, which is two and a half billion dollars a year. They actually blackmail Israel to stop the project after it was done. They came to the final step. Now they have to just manufacture the plane. Why? Because they knew it's going to put all American companies out of business. Cheaper and better, and Israel is going to sell to the whole world. Problem is that the Israelis cannot tell the difference between their greed and security. They're willing to sell their soul to the Satan. So who did they sell this airplane to with all the secrets of it? To China. China bought all the planes and they made the airplanes themselves. And now they're selling it to who? To Pakistan and soon to Iran. Iran is going to have these airplanes with Israeli ideas and technology. And who knows how many upgrades the Chinese added to it. Because they, they're very good. So what we made will be used against our own children. Why? Greed. Greed. Money. Money hunger. Let me take the millions now and let me die tomorrow as long as I get the money now. In America, they call it penny-wise, dollar foolish. Give me the penny now. I don't want to wait for the dollar 10 years. That's what they do. Between all these problems, Baruch Hashem, the world, as you know, now is divided to two sides regardless of religion. Religion is one aspect. The world is divided now to people that live in a rational lifestyle with the right head, with two legs on the floor, without conspiracy theories, without all these illusions, without believing everything they, they listen to on YouTube and drive themselves crazy with all kinds of ideas. 5G and that and the government and Illuminati, all this crazy nonsense that you hear nonstop. So you have people that are living normal, sticking to Hashem, to Torah, or even those who are not religious, but they don't follow every little thing that comes every two minutes. And then you have the people that their God is YouTube. Every five minutes, something new. Did you hear? Bill Gates is Hitler. He wants to kill. Bill Gates changed his mind. Bill Gates is pro-vaccine. Bill Gates is against vaccine. He's worse than Hitler. This one and Illuminati and they follow you and the 5G will fry your brain and it spreads corona and the vaccine is gonna, the, in five years everyone will not be able to have kids. Non-stop millions of theories. Millions. Literally millions. And I believe everything. You come to these people that most of them are complete idiots. You come to them and you say to them, listen, there is a divine Torah that was given to the Jewish people in a public event in front of millions of witnesses. They will do everything they can to deny it, even though you have thousands of proofs. Real proofs! Not some make loon attack on YouTube made up a fake video. Real proofs! They won't accept it no matter what. Every theory out there, they buy it like it's mamash the words of Hashem. What's going on over here? Hashem is divided the world to two sides. People with head on their shoulder and people with empty head on their shoulder. It's divided. In the positive side, you have religious and non-religious people. Jews and non-Jews. In the people that live in illusion and love conspiracy and all kinds of assumption, you also have Jews, non-Jews, all kinds of people, religious, not religious. It's very interesting. I heard uh, today something I could not believe. I, uh, I cannot believe that it's something like this can, can actually happen. 
I don't have to tell you, you know that today it's very difficult to find the right soulmate. Very difficult. Most people are having difficult time in Shiduchim. And even those who got married, most of them do not even know if the one that they married to is their, really, their Shiduch. They live with this question mark. How do I even know that that's my real Shiduch? A lot of people are puzzled, they're confused, they don't know. One day they think it is, the next day they're sure that's not that. So because it's difficult, people find alternative options. Listen to this. A man in Australia revealed how he fell in love, fell in love with a female robot. They made a shape of a woman, machine, with artificial intelligence, AI. Just like the, what do you call that thing from Apple, that uh, Siri, Siri? You ask question and it get to, to know you. It already knows who you are and what you like, what you don't like. It's very interesting how the computer learns. So he fell in love with the robot named Emma. <laughs> they even gave her a name. Emma. <laughs> but, you're waiting for that? They planning, they, they planning to get married soon. There will be the first marriage between man and machine. When I told you that a year ago, that the day that people would marry animals and people would marry all kinds of robots, you thought I'm crazy, huh? <laughs> it's happening already. Go to YouTube, women that marry their dogs. Thousands in America marry their dogs with a wedding gown. No joke. No joke. She dressed like a bride. And there's a dog right next to her. Under the chupa. Will you marry me? How, how? In America. America, an advanced country. So he wants to marry Emma. I cannot imagine my life without her. Well, obviously, it's a mental disease. I hope you not question it. But I want to tell you the point here. The point here, Rabotai, when Hashem designed the human being, we have a physical body and we have a computer. The brain is the computer. When you buy a car today, you have the computer of the car and it controls all the mechanical parts. The transmission, the engine, the stick shift. Everything goes through the computer. If something goes wrong with the programming of the computer, the Transmission gets stuck. All of a sudden, the car will smoke. You wonder to yourself, oh, maybe the muffler is broken. Maybe the transmission is broken. Maybe the engine is broken. Maybe this, maybe that. In the end, no, it's all electronic. It's the computer. You reprogram the computer to two minutes. Automatically, the car drives brand new. It's a different era now. It's not what it used to be, all mechanic. Now it's basically all all electronic and all computerized. The same thing is the human being. Even though we look like a machine, you know, like, you know, flesh and skin and muscles, in the end everybody understands that all the sicknesses and all the pain and whatever your body is going through, it's starting in a box, in a, in a computer. Now what happens if the computer is going off program? is not as it's supposed to be. All the problems begin. Besides all the physical pain that you have, you have a lot of mental issues. Mental issues. Fear, anxiety attack, panic attack, short breath, all kinds of vibrations in the muscles, the eyes are shaking, the muscles are shaking, all of a sudden, sharp pains come and go and comes and go. The shortage in the brain. 
The person, either he has problems in his stomach, he cannot digest, cannot eat. I know someone, he can eat. Nothing can be digested. Look like this tripod. Everything I eat, I cannot digest. If they want to go to a restaurant, they cannot order anything besides drink. And you know, restaurants don't like it. You sit, you want to watch a show, but you don't order anything. So what do they say? Uh, I'll pay for a meal even though I cannot eat it. Here, how much a meal would be? $50, take $50. Let me just sit here and watch the show. What do you care? Why? I can't eat. Why? Something in the brain. Cannot digest. Stomach don't function. That's what's happening right now. So when a person has problems in a computer, how the problems begin in a computer? The computer can be affected by what you see and what you hear. Remember, the best artificial intelligence is the brain of the human being. No artificial intelligence that will ever be invented will be even 1% as good as your brain. If the brain sees something, the eyes, sends a message to the brain, who immediately analyzes all the information with billions of details. How many people and noises and, uh, and it takes billions of things to consideration. And immediately the body reacts right after. Going into defense mode, into happy mode, into that mode and this mode. It's unbelievable how. But what happens when you enter to the brain false information? Everything is false. You see, vid you see movies, all these Hollywood movies. Shooting, killing, chopping heads. All day, violence and aggression. The brain was not designed to receive millions of episodes of murder and rape and who knows what else. If it happens once or twice in a person's life that he saw something like that, the brain is equipped to know how to react. But if you see it a million times a year instead of twice in a lifetime, it messed up the brain. It messed up your private life. Why 70% of the people get divorced? Because all the things they watch. If you would eliminate, if you would eliminate, eliminate completely TV and internet, and there would not be movies at all. Let's see, you go back a hundred times in history. No movies. They didn't invent the, the, the first theater at all. The life of the people would be a lot better. No illusions, no violence, no cursing, no terrible fashion, none of these things. Life would be a lot better. The level of the people was a lot better. Today, it's all a zoo. To the point that a man is in, in love with a robot. How can a person be in love with a piece of metal? With a piece of rubber? With a piece of wood? What is happening here? The brain doesn't function. It doesn't see the difference. And there are millions of other examples which some of them I can give you, but we don't have time to waste. So the people continue to destroy the world. They continue to destroy the climate. They continue to destroy the psychology of the humankind. And then they wonder why there's so many problems. The reason I told you all this introduction before I start my lecture is only one. We have to ask ourselves only one question. How long, how long the creator of the world would go alone with this nonsense until he loses patience? A few times in the history, for much less than that, he wiped up humanity. Sodom and Gomorrah, the flood in the times of Noah. A hundred years ago, as a pandemic, you kill a hundred million people. hundred million people. Two years of horror now, five million people died in Corona. 
and half of them probably did not die from corona. There was heart attacks and cancer and flu and other problems. Hospitals had an incentive to write that it was corona because they got paid $30,000 a head. Probably half of the cases were not corona. But let's say it, it was, okay? Let's not open another argument. So five million in two years. Five million from eight billion. That's nothing. Statistically, com compared to eight billion, it's not a percent of a percent. Eight billion. Eighty million people is one percent. Eighty million people. Right? 80 million. So a tenth of a percent is 8 million. That means we are less than a tenth of a percent of death. Assuming it's all corona, and we know it's not. So it's really a very minor fracture. The damage in the financial damage is hundreds of billions, maybe a trillion dollars, who knows, to the whole world. But a hundred years ago, I do not know exactly how many people the world had. Maybe a billion, maybe less. It wasn't eight billion a hundred years ago. So if you had, I don't know, half a billion people, and from that a hundred million died, that's 25%. If you had a billion people and a hundred million died, it's 10%. That's a pandemic. That's a massive tragedy. One out of 10 dies within a year. That's a serious problem. It's almost wiping out humanity. Today is a lot of panic. Let's analyze for a second. If today we didn't have the media, we didn't have television, we didn't have CNN, we didn't have internet, we didn't have all that, nobody would know about corona. No one would talk about it. People would get it, they think it's a flu. They'd be home, some people would die, but they would think they die from flu, and that would be the end of it. That's it. They would not close anything. They would not torture people waiting all day in line to get PCR tests. You would not have, uh, you would not have any you know, quarantine and all this headache that they give to people. Millions of people would not run to the airport, go through the checking and all that, and in the last minute they take them off the flight. How much torture? All of that is from what? From media, social media. Think about it. Look how much damage we made to ourselves. Why do you have some social media? Curiosity and evilness. Everyone is bloodthirsty. Every piece of news, wow. Such excitement to see someone is indicted and someone is arrested and someone is executed and someone is going to jail and to know about the life of every stupid celebrity out there that has been married already eight times. All of that is emptiness. Emptiness. Someone who is full of Torah, he needs social media. Someone who is a real Talmud Chacham, he doesn't know even what smartphone is. Come to my yeshiva in Yerushalayim. Nobody knows what a computer is. Nobody knows what a smartphone is. Nobody knows about these things. None of the things that people here cannot live a minute without it, they have in their life. Their life is Gemara and Rambam and Rashi and Tosafot and the Chumash and this halacha and that halacha. That's it. Your entire life is full of holiness. Modesty, simple, down to earth, no addictions. Zero addiction, no cigarettes, no drugs, no women, no money, no clothes, no jewelry, no cars, none of these things. No politics, no curiosity, none of them knows the politician. Come to my yeshiva, ask them who's the prime minister, nobody knows. Nobody knows, I don't listen to the news. Nobody knows, I was just in Israel two, two, two weeks ago I came back. I went to the house of my own rabbi. I had to tell him what's happening now in the government with these lefties and the traders and the Muslim brothers. No idea who was against who, Bichlal. Why? We're in a different planet. In a different planet, Rabotai. 
We read in Shabbat, Parashat Vaera, and this is what Hashem said, וגם אני שמעתי, and also I heard, the scream, נעקת, what does it mean נעקה? What's the difference between צעקה and נעקה? There's many different words, שבעתם, נעקתם, צעקתם, זעקתם. Every word has something unique about it. Na'aka means that you are buried under a weight of suffering. So much suffering on your head and on your shoulder that you feel like you're drowning in the ground. It's unbearable. So what happens when you reach such level of suffering? You begin to scream like crazy. When I went to LA, It was, it was Christmas Eve, Friday morning. I left Monsi at 3 a.m. and went to Newark Airport, got there around four something. The driver that I had did not replace his tires, negligence, he's not ready for the winter. So in a miracle, we made it to the airport. Instead of dying, we somehow made it to the airport. The car was sliding. We had to drive 40 miles an hour. Mamash, with the, with, the, with the mercy of Hashem, we made it somehow. It was the first snow that morning. It wasn't a lot, not even an inch of snow. Well, <laughs> when you're tired or not ready, you slide. Finally, we made it. I thought my nightmare is over. My mind was how the poor driver will make it back to his house. Bezrat Hashem, I have to read Tehilim. When I finish with the security, I'll read a few chapters of Tehilim for him to make it home. You know? Hoping that the temperature will rise by two, three degrees, that the, the, the snow will melt, that at least he can make it home. But just when I thought that's the worst of my problem, I found out that's the least of my problem. As soon as I walked into the terminal, I see a guy standing with a sign. 60 minutes. I didn't understand. What, what is this? 60 minutes. I was about to walk. I said, excuse me. Stand over here. By the door to the street. What do you mean? I have to walk. 400 yards to get to the passport checking. No, my friend. The lines begin over here. More than a thousand people waiting online. More than a thousand people. Now, my flight was supposed to be 6.30 a.m. With Hashem mercy, it was postponed by one hour. Otherwise, I would not make it. An hour and a half standing online like this. Left and right and left and right and left. And it doesn't end. Why did I remember this now? People had a six o'clock flight and now it's six or seven and they're still online to the passport and you still have security. People lost their mind. Remember this goyim that they have to go to their family for the annual holiday, Christmas. This is the, the, the moment of their life. The little life that they have with their family here in America is once a year. They had, they, you had to see how people started to scream. Excuse me! I have a flight! I felt like I'm in a holocaust or something. People waiting for the, on the line to the gas chambers over there. There was one Jewish family, modern Orthodox. They said, we have a six o'clock flight. We're not going to make it. It was five to six. I say to them, just go. What are you waiting? Instead of going left and right, left and right, just cut it like this. Here, I opened the road for you. But they were so decent in their midot that knowing they're going to miss their flight after all the nightmare that I've been waiting for an hour and a half, they're going to miss the flight not to do Chilul Hashem. But you know what? When I finally convinced both of them, the father and the mother, there was a little girl, she started to cry. No, I don't want to cut the line. Did they miss the flight or not? I'm dying to know. 
maybe, I mean, technically the flight was at 6 o'clock and 6.10 they were still there, so I don't know. But this is what happened over there. That's called Naaka. And you scream already when you, that's it, I have no more hope. I, know, I have no more desire to live. So Hashem said to Moshe, I heard the suffering that the Jews are going through with the Egyptian torturing them. But I remember my covenant. I remember my covenant. What, what does it have to do now with the screaming? I remember my covenant. Ma kavana va escoret briti. How is it uh, connect to the to the screaming right now? Technically, you know, in a simple way of understanding, Hashem remembered the covenant He made with Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. What is it? He said to Avraham, "Your children will be slaves in a country of goyim, and eventually." After all the suffering, I'll get them out of there and they will come out very wealthy. Then I'll give them the Torah and I'll bring them to the Holy Land and they build the temple. It's a process. So now Hashem is remembering the covenant that he made with Abraham, Brit Ben Abetarim. How many years ago was that? 425 years before they came out of Egypt. But five years before that, five years before that, Hashem already told this to Avram Avinu. Five years before Brita Ben Abetarim. That's why we count 430 years from the moment that Hashem first told Avram about the plan. How many years they were really in Egypt? 210. What happened? 400 or 210? The answer, it was supposed to be 400. But it was in the end 210. Why? If you're supposed to work 10 hours a day and the Egyptian makes you work 19 hours a day, what do you think Hashem is going to do? Recalculate. Recalculate the Cheshbon. 210 years with 19 hours a day, it's like 400 years of 10 hours a day. In the Gemara in Masechet Chagiga, the Gemara in Masechet Chagiga, page 5, it's written, Rabbi Yochanan, Kimate le'ai kra bachi. When he came to that Pasuk, he was crying. Why? It's written in a Pasuk, והיה כי תמצאנה אותו רעות רבות וצרות. That the Jewish people will have problems and tragedies, multiple problems. רבי יוחנן was crying. Why? He said, a servant that is master torture him. What kind of a solution he has? The Gemara in Masechet Brachot, page 5, the Gemara says, How do we know from the Torah that suffering erase your sins? How do you know? Maybe it's, an, it's a pure punishment and that's it. How do you know it's actually erased the sins from your file? Person got cancer now. Two years, suffering, chemo, needles, this, that, pain, losing his hair. Losing weight, cannot go to parties, he has to sacrifice a lot because of it. How do you know it's not in vain? Tough luck. You got it, he didn't. He got lucky, you, do, you did not get lucky. Who told you there is a calculation over here? That's the argument now in Egmara. It's not an argument, it's a proof. Rabbi Yochanan say, you learn it from, needless to say, Kal Vachomer, with what? Shen Vain. Shen, a tut, and a eye. If the master beat up his servant and he broke his tut, or he poked his eye, he has to let him go. 
You have a servant, boom, you give him a punch. His eye came out. Or you broke a tooth. The Gemara says, it sends the servant to freedom. If one tooth, one tooth sends a servant to freedom, suffering in all over the body will not send the person to freedom? Kalvachomir. Kalachat Kalavachama. And Rish Lakish, Rish Lakish was the Hevruta of Rabbi Yochanan. I don't have to remind you that Rabbi Yochanan was holy from birth all his life. Rish Lakish was the head of the mafia. The head of the mafia was a gangster. One day he passed by the river, he saw from far away a pretty woman is, is uh, swimming in a lake. He jumped, swimming like Tarzan, proving his skills. Wow, he swims better than a fish. To, imp to impress that woman, you know? Finally, when he arrived, he found out it's not a woman, it's a man. All of that was for nothing. How can you make a mistake between a man and a woman in the old days? There was no Gillette yet. So nobody could, uh, no, nobody could shave. So every man had a beard and a woman does not have a beard. So how do you make a mistake? At one point, don't you see that as a man? Rabbi Yochanan did not have a beard. Some men don't have beard, like Ladino, Latinos, Italians. They have very little. I've seen people like Chinese. You see in China, they have a little bit here and there, and the whole face is smooth. It doesn't grow. So Rabbi Yochanan was such a handsome man that he looked pretty like a woman. Plus, especially he didn't have a beard from far away. And look like a woman is swimming. What happened? He told him, oh, I know you came all the way. You thought it's a woman here. Shame on you. But don't worry. My sister is a lot prettier than me. If you will repent and become a tzaddik, I'll set you up with her. Obviously, shiduchim back then was a lot easier than today. Today, if you had one week in your life that you lapse in religion, nobody wants you. Oh, he went off the derech for a short period of time. But now he's a big tzaddik. Talmid Chacham. If we remember that five years ago he had a, a lap, you know. No, no, we don't want. Today, if, if you are a big Talmid Chacham, but you have a brother that is of the derech, half of the Shiduchim don't want you. What does it have to do with you? Yaakov Mary Rachel, even though he had a sav. Nobody cared about the sav, we cared about Yaakov. No, no, in Shiduchim it's not good. Back then it was a lot easier. Rabbi Akiva got married to a princess, Rachel, the daughter of Kalba Savua, the Gvir. A Gvir would agree to take a 40 years old man that cleaning horses without a penny to his name, coming from converts, divorce with the son, some say, had all the skills, doesn't know alphabet, did not go to yeshiva. And she is the most desirable woman in the, in the whole country. Smart, pretty, rich. So a father is the sponsor of everyone. Everyone who comes to him hungry like a dog comes out full and happy, wealthy, generous, gvir. Can get the best Tamid Chacham she can get. No, I like him. I like him. He has good skills, good midot. He's shy. When he speaks, he doesn't pick up his head, his eyes. He has good midot. He is a good raw material. I'll turn him into a chacham. I will turn him into a chacham. Today, what girl from Bet Yaakov would agree to take 40 years old man, doesn't know alphabet, 
never went to yeshiva, in this case not even to public school, because if you go to public school at least you know how to read, right? He didn't even go to school b'chlal, doesn't know how to read and write. And on top of that, believe it or not, later when he became the, the most important Jew in history, meaning the highest that he reached on his own, most important one was Moshe Rabbeinu. But Rabbi Akiva reached the level of Moshe on his own in 80 years of effort. Moshe got a CD inserted to his head with the whole Torah. In 40 days, Rabbi Akiva got it on his own with 80 years of, of sweat in very hard conditions. He reached the highest level a man can ever reach. Ever. And then he said, you know, when I used to be an ignorant, I'm a Aretz. You know how much I hated rabbis? If you give me a rabbi back then when I was an ignorant, I would, I would buy him a bite of a donkey. Not a bite of a dog. Bite of a dog makes few holes around your, 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 your bone. But it doesn't smash the bone and make the bone into a powder. But when a donkey bites you, your bone is cracked to hundreds of pieces. No way to fix it. Today, they have surgery, they can open, they can insert an artificial bone, they can fix things. But back then, that's it, you lost your hand or your leg, whatever it was. That's how much I hated them. Why? The Gemara say, in nature, you have many solid rules. Rules. One of the rules, when temperature go to 32 degrees, it's freezing. The water begins to freeze. Or zero Celsius. There is a lot of rules in nature. One of the rules in nature, the more Amaaretz you are, the more you hate rabbis. That's a law. And your wife, even more than you. Gdola sina shesonim ha-me'aratzot et ha-talmide chachamim de gmara say, and their wives even more. Why is it? Why an ignorant Jew hates talmide chachamim? Why in Israel they hate so much those who sit and learn Torah? Why they hate them so much? Why? Why they don't hate the Hamas terrorist? Why they don't hate the gays? Why they don't hate criminals, murderers, con artists? Nobody makes demonstrations against them. Nobody speaks non-stop against them. But almost everyone is allergic to Talmidei Chachamim. Why is it? The answer, it's the law in nature. It's a law. It has to be this way. Of course, there is some exception to the rules. From time to time, you find a Aratzot that loves rabbis and would die for them, yes. But there are 5%, 10% of the population. The vast majority hates them. As soon as they see a Chacham, it drives them crazy. Rabbi Akiva admit, I was like that also. And now he became the biggest Chacham ever. So now... Rabbi Yochanan sitting together with Rish Lakish. Rish Lakish came to the yeshiva, became a big chacham, he was brilliant, he, made, he turned him into a serious chacham. They became chevruta for the rest of their life, until he died. Once he died, Rabbi Yochanan lost his mind. That's where the, we got the sentence, or chevruta or mituta. If you don't have chevruta who to learn with in a high level, according to your level, Better to die than to live like that. Rabbi Yochanan lost ten sons. They all died. And he stayed normal. Do you know one person in the world that would lose ten children and stay normal? And it's in ten different tragedies. Not all in one shot. All in one shot is a huge tragedy. But it's a one tragedy. Big, very big. But it won't. Five years later, may you, maybe you will recuperate a little bit, a little bit. But imagine every year a tragedy. Boom, you lost another one. Boom, another one. Boom, another one. Wow. Keep hitting you again and again and again. You're losing your mind, for sure. He didn't lose his mind. It was deep in the Torah. But when he lost his chevruta, he lost his mind. The Chachamim gathered to pray that Hashem will take him away from life. From here we learn that you are allowed to pray that someone will die. 
for his own good, if he suffers very much. Even though we know in one hand that suffering is, that's what we're talking here about, erase a lot of the sins and save you from much bigger suffering later on. But the Gemara say, as much as we know that suffering is great and productive for us, we can live without them and we give up on them and we give up on the reward, the Chachamim say. Why? It's very difficult to see someone suffer like this. So now, they continue to argue over here. Rish Lakish said, Rabbi Yochanan say, you learned that suffering erased the sins from a slave. You broke his tooth, you, you set him free. For a tooth, he goes free if someone suffering every inch of his body he is not going to set him free. So, Rish Laki said, we learn it from Gzera Shava. What does it mean, Gzera Shava? Moshe Rabbeinu got X amount of Gzerot Shavot in Mount Sinai. There are verses in the Torah. And you have a mutual word between this verse to a verse somewhere else. Mutual word. Two different topics. This verse talks about this and this verse talks about that. But because you have a mutual word, word it's to say that there is a connection between what you learn in this verse to what you learn from this verse. It's complicated. You need to know Gemara to understand that. But that's a decree from Hashem. Don't look for logic here. How many Gzerot Shavot, if I remember correctly from my days in Yeshiva? 400. 400 all together. Rish Lakis say, you learn from Gzera Shava. Where when we talk about salt, Brit Melach, salt covenant, right? Neemar Brit be Melach, Neemar Brit be Isurim. When it comes to salt, it says the word Brit. Brit is a, a agreement, covenant. When it comes to suffering, it also says the word Brit. Right? In the verse it says, Velotash bit melach Brit. And in the suffering it says, Ele divre Brit. Same way, Rish Laki say, salt, when you put it on the Meat, what does it do to the meat? Makes the meat better. Get rid of all the bitter blood and make the meat a little bit sweeter and better. Right? Remove all the liquid. And off the record, all the urine also. Because once the goyim kill the animal without slaughtering and they don't put salt, it takes a few hours until they cut the cow and begin to clean it from inside, remove the skin. In the meantime, all the meat is marinated in a lot of urine and blood. That's why the meat in McDonald's is very juicy. And next time when you suck the juice of the meat, remember what you're really eating. After you will remember what you're really eating, I'm sure you're going to run to the glut kosher. Pero more. But it's really, really much more recommended. So, Brit of the salt makes the meat better, get rid of the bitterness, suffering, get rid of the sins of the human being. In the end, there are many verses in the Tanakh that shows that because a person suffers, Hashem actually gave them what they wanted. Meaning, without that suffering, they would not get it. It's very interesting. Some of the things that we can learn from this parasha, I made myself a few notes on Motzei Shabbat. I would like to share it with you, Bezrat Hashem. Because time is running out, we don't have that much time left. But at least let's just go over the notes that I made. Here you go. Speaking about the blood, how the soul removed the blood and other liquid in Parashat Re'e. Parashat Re'e. It's written, 
Where is פרשת ראה? Who knows? What ספר? ספר דברים, דולרנמי, דברים י"ב. The 12th chapter in the book of Deuteronomy. That's פרשת ראה. It comes usually right before the month of Elul. The week before Rosh Chodesh Elul. Always falls פרשת ראה. Why? רש א' ה' בריוויישן רש ראה אלול הגיע ראה פי אטנשן אלול ארייבד אוקיי It's written רק חזק be strong לבלתי יכול אדם do not eat the blood of the animal כי האדם הוא הנפש Because the blood is the spirit, is the nefesh, like this, the, the animals don't have a soul, but their spirituality, meaning what keeps them alive, is the nefesh, it's in the blood. Lo tochlenu, don't eat it. Leman, that it should benefit you, leman yetav lecha ulevanecha acharecha, that you, and your children after you will get rewarded. For what? For not eating the disgusting blood of the cow. If I will bring you now a glass of, of, of blood from a cow or from a sheep, would you be able to drink it? Most likely not. Even though there are plenty of crazy people in this world, you don't know anymore what to expect. Right? But a normal person will not want to drink it. How about if I give you $500 and you're not exactly rich? <laughs> you still say, no, no, I can't, I can't. I'd rather be hungry for a day or two than to drink this blood. If I make it $2,000, wow, that's your entire monthly rent. If you're willing now to commit suicide and drink it, I promise you, you will close your nose and drink it, cough, and vomit, and be upset for three days. Agree or not? Agree or not? Agree. Why the Torah has to warn us not to eat the blood? What, we crazy? What are we, vampire? What are we? Be careful not to eat the blood. And because you're not going to eat the blood, I will benefit you and your children after you. But wait, it gets better. Ki ta'aseh ayashar be'ane Hashem. If somebody asks you, Rabbi, you keep talking about ideology, ideology, hashkafa. In Hebrew it's called hashkafa. Ideology, ideology, ideology. Ashkafa. I want to ask you. Shh. Where does it say in the Torah there is such a thing, Jewish Ashkafa? Find me the source. Maybe it's man-made invention. Maybe the Chachamim invented it. Maybe all the speakers in yeshivot in the last 2,000 years made it up and one copy from the other. Where does it say in the Torah Jewish Ashkafa? I just read it to you. Ve'asita ayashar ve'atov be'ene Hashem. You do what's straight and what's decent in the eyes of Hashem, not in your eyes. Not in the eyes of the Democrats. Not in the eyes of Sleepy Joe and in the eyes of the gays and in the eyes of the Muslims and in the eyes of the Christians. Not in the eyes of the Reform and not in the eyes of the conservative and the other idol worshippers. Not in their eyes. Not in the eyes of the Israeli government. You do what's right in my eyes, not in the eyes of your professors in university. That half of them is mentally sick and the other half is, are gays. That's not what I want you to be. But he's a mathematician. But check his lifestyle. See who he's married to. 
See how we live. See what an infidel he is. See what an ungrateful creature. Now one time he said thank you to his creator. Now one time he appreciate what he have done for him. Look what kind of a father he is. Look, look what kind of a parent he is. Look what nonsense he follows. That's what you want to be? You have no permission to be like that. You have to do what's right in my eyes. I say it's filthy to be gays. That's the truth. Don't let anyone brainwash you. No, it's the, it's the nature. He was born like that. Baloney. Don't let people brainwash you with their lies. The truth is what's written in the book of God. Everything else is false. If it contradicts the original book of God, it's false. Even if people will tell you a million times that it's right, it does not make it right. Just because you repeat the same lie a thousand times doesn't make it right. That's what people don't understand. Just because all the media are poor abomination doesn't make it right. Just because corruption is everywhere doesn't make it right. Just because everybody smokes doesn't make it right. Or take drugs does not make it right. Just because 70% of the Jews are intermarried with other nations doesn't make it right. My wife, she's a very nice girl. She's very nice. Nobody ever says she's not nice. Maybe she's even nicer than you. You're the Jew and she's the Goya. She's much better than you. Could be. Maybe she's righteous Gentile. She's, she's a lover of Hashem. Maybe she has great personality. Maybe she's generous. Maybe she's modest. Maybe she's a noble woman. Nobody question it. Could be much better than you. You don't have permission to marry her. Your children will not be Jewish. You will die lonely. You will not have continuation. Why? The creator of the world made rules. You want to debate those rules? Cannot be. You, you want to be so foolish. What do you want to declare a war against the creator of the world? Are you out of your mind? To, to declare a war against Putin, nobody has the guts. You want to declare a war against God? You saw what happened to few people who messed with Putin a little bit. The Georgians, the Ukrainians. They don't sleep at night already for two years, three years from that moment. And it was going easy on them. Why? You don't mess with the wrong people. You don't mess with the head of the Italian mafia. You don't mess with the head of the Hamas. You don't mess with the head of the Hezbollah. This is crazy people that will wipe you out and your children. You have to know who to mess with. If you finally decided to mess with someone, make sure it's not going to be the end of your life. You want to mess with the creator of the world? You want to lose your eternity? You want to destroy your neshama for eternity? And you go and support gays and take pictures and put their pictures in your Facebook? And you call yourself Orthodox Rabbi? You're promoting idol worshipping Christians? You bring them into your synagogue and you call yourself a rabbi? You don't deserve to be called a Jew, Bichlal. You're a Christian, you're a missionary. What are you? Mediach la'avodah zara. What does the Gemara say? What, what's the halakha of someone who promotes idol worshipping religion? What's the law? Not my law. I did not write the Torah. What's the law of, the, of, of Judaism? What's the law? Death penalty. Mediach la'avodah zara. It's in Taryag Mitzvot. You want to start a war against Hashem and promote a fake religion who questions his religion? Who fights his real religion? There is the original book of God and someone made up a fake fairy tale book and you want to promote it inside the house of Hashem? Do you know a bigger crime than this? It's happening as we speak in Boca Raton. And it's not the first time. And you want to hear the biggest hypocrisy? This clown who does it makes conversions. Do you really think that this goyim that he converted are Jews? Bichlal? He himself is a goy. How can a goy convert goyim to be Jewish? Wow. And he's in this religious magazine. He has a weekly column there. That's just to show you how religious those magazines are. They also promote the monster who rape kids and married women. 
They also promote him and defend him for years. Even though there are many big rumors about what he does, but they don't care. They're looking for aiding, just like the secular newspapers, no difference. They find themselves names like they are some kind of Orthodox Jews. You're not allowed to bring those magazines into your house. It's a killer for your neshama, for your children's neshama. Killer. You know how much heresy you have there? Just the advertisement over there destroyed your mentality. All these fancy schmancy pictures of Vegas and Dubai and Bahamas and the rest of their nonsense. It's the life of a kosher Jew. All these fancy schmancy wigs and this and the jewelry, how they corrupt all the girls from Bet Yaakov to become like Goyot with their greed. They push it into their face and they're all in competition. Who's going to have the biggest diamond ring? This is all these magazines. They destroy the generation. You spend $20,000 a year tuition to send your kids to good kosher schools and in the end you bring this stupid magazine for $5 for Shabbat and in one month they destroyed all your children. Mass murder machine, those religious magazines. That's the truth. The truth has to be said. There's not one real Talmud Chacham in the world that would approve those magazines. One woman that she's very famous, she called one of their magazines. She said, who is your spiritual supervisor? You have a mashgiach ruchani? You had to see what they did to her. Scream at her and hang up the phone on her. How do you dare to even ask such a question? Of course they don't have. What normal mashgiach ruchani will give us to such mass murder spiritual machine? So Rabotai, I want to ask you a question. Why did Hashem have to warn us from not eating blood? It's like, it's like saying, don't eat sand. And thanks to that, I will give you wonderful life and to your children after you. Don't eat sand. Thank you very much. I had no plan to eat sand and I had no plan to eat blood. Now you wait and see, Rabotai. The Gemara in Masechet Makod, page 23. The Gemara says, Amar Rabbi Shimon, Ma Adam, the blood, Shenafsho Shel Adam Katsa Mimeno, that a person is disgusted from it. Blood is disgusting. Nobody wants to eat blood. The Torah says that if you don't touch it, you're going to get a reward. Gezel ve'arayot, stealing, and sex crimes, that a person after that so much passionately, if he holds himself back from not stealing and not breaking the laws of the Torah with intimacy rules, when a person desires them very much, if he does not break the law, it's needless to say how much reward him and his children will get. If for the blood that you are disgusted by that, you're going to get a reward and your children after you, imagine when you're about to steal or to, to cheat or to take extra money in an easy way but not kosher or to do a forbidden uh, uh, relationship or all these things. Imagine how much reward you're going to get until the end of your generations. That's Rabbi Shimon in Egmara Masechet Makod, page 23. <sighs> Unbelievable, Rabotai. You know, it's written in a parasha that speaking about blood, Bnei Israel became wealthy thanks to the blood. Dam, Tzfardea, Kinim. First shot, first plague that Hashem brought on the Egyptian, blood. Where the entire Nile became red. By the way, things like this even happen in our days. I saw a video of a whole lake somewhere in the world became all red. Blood. Unbelievable. Everyone is shocked. How come the whole river became blood? So the whole Nile, which is a very, very long river, very long, 
thousands of miles, who knows how much. All red. And there's no other source of water in Egypt. Now the Egyptian touch the water, it becomes blood. The Jew takes the glass from his hand, become water. The Jew drinks water. The Egyptians say, give me some water, I'm dying. They're about to drink, it becomes red. Water, blood, water, blood. Unless you pay for it. I'll buy it from you. Kadima, Yosef, Yitzhak, give me a little water. How much? Ten dollars. So much? There's no other water. Yeah. Be my guest. Go buy somewhere else. Ten dollars. Oh my God. Tov, here, ten dollars. Egyptian just drank. One more day survived. The Jews collecting piles of money. Piles of money. One time he goes say <laughs> to the Jews, you Jews love money so much. He say, yeah, and you, the Goim, hate it so much. So since you hate it so much, give us what you have. You don't, they don't love it. And we love it, and you hate it, so give it to us. Ah, you don't want? Oh, so you also love money. Very interesting. I thought we only the only one who loves money. To love money is a good thing or a bad thing? What do you think? To be money lover, it's a positive or a negative thing? Huh? I don't hear an answer here. What's going on? Depend. Oh, depend. What? Depend on what? Depend what you want the money for. If you want the money to have a normal home and decent food and nice clothes for you and your children, and to do a lot of mitzvot, to buy the best fill-in, which reminds me, I brought unbelievable, highest in the world level of tefillin. And of course, for less than half a price than what you get it somewhere else, and you can get it somewhere else. All handmade. Not one machine was used. All by hands. Makes the process ten times longer, but unbelievable. Best sofer, Avovadia Yosef chose his riding. Could not be best of the best. So, you want to buy the best filling, you want to buy the best mezuzot, you want to invest in, the, in things, in Torah, and putting your children with the best yeshivot, get them the right to there, help your children to move into a house that can sit and learn Torah peacefully. So, if your mind is on spiritual things, one woman, she has a dream. She invests here, she invests there, she's trying, you know, to make money. So she said to me, before I met you, what did I want my money for? To buy a Mercedes, to buy a fair coat, to buy another diamond, to buy, you know, like everyone else. Now when I'm becoming more and more religious, and I understand the purpose of life, I have a different dream now. I really anxious to make money even more than before, but for different reason. Why do I want to sponsor your entire yeshiva in Israel? Please pray for me that once I make money, I will sponsor the whole yeshiva. Oh, whether you make money or don't make money, one thing you already earned, that your dreams change from negative to positive. Hashem loves it. Loves it. Why do you want money, Moshe? I want to buy another yacht. Why you want to, why you want money, Yitzchak? I want to open yeshiva. I want to put kids there, talmidim, to learn Torah. It's my dream to sponsor, pay each one of them a decent salary that I can live, that I can sit and learn, to save more souls, to make more USBs, to give more books to people. That's my dream. Ah, that's your dream. Already it says that if you wanted to do a mitzvah, but you were forced not to do it against your will, count like you did it. So the dreams, once you already have a kosher dream, and you do everything you can to do it, you didn't get the money. <laughs> it's all about money in the end. And you didn't get it. 
When you come to Hashem, He said, don't worry, I know you wanted to do it. But I have different plans for your future. For different reasons, Hashem has His calculation. But at least I'm impressed that that was your plan. There's only one problem. Sometimes it happens, and you do get the money. And usually, from experience, from experience, once you have the money in your hand, your priorities change instantly. I once told you a story that I have a friend that people sued him for $10 million. And it wasn't his fault. He was innocent. He introduced people to a crook. But nobody knew he was a crook. He was paying. Everyone who invested money by that, that crook made money. They were making good money, like 12% a year. Great. One day, they, you know, the Ponzi scam. Eventually, the crook ran out of money and he couldn't pay. In the meantime, these people continue to give more money to the crook, not knowing he's going to turn to be a crook. Behind the broker's back, they don't want him to get commission. So the first deal, he got commission from the crook for introducing investors. Next time they came to the crook and they said, listen, we're going to give you more money in one condition. Don't tell it to the guy. The commission you have to give him, give it to us. Whatever it was, 2%, I don't know what. And he's a crook. They are not honest. They did another few millions. And what happened in the end? The FBI called him and put him in prison. After they lost $10 million by this crook, they made some money over the years, but now they, they lost their initial investment, the principal. Who they decided to sue? The guy who introduced them to the crook, not knowing he's a crook. He himself invested money by him. But he was lucky to take his money out before he collapsed. So they took him to a court, and the corrupted judge and the corrupted Sodom and Gomorrah court of New Jersey found him guilty. In a million years, you would never believe such corruption. How he can be guilty? I introduce you to someone who right now is kosher. He's paying, everything is fine. Then you go behind my back and continue to do business with him for a few more years. Then he steal your money, and now you come to me and I have to pay you? Did they ever hear such thing? In America, you heard it. It happened. So he said to me, listen, I'm going to appeal, but my lawyers want half a million dollars to appeal. The lawyers, Rabotai, they're very expensive, these lawyers. And the chances to win an appeal, statistically, it's 2% meaning 98% chance that this half a million dollar will be burned. I'm going against all odds, almost. I took him to my rabbi in Israel, which I usually don't do, gave him a blessing. He went to some other rabbinim, gave him a blessing. He said to me, pray for me every day. You have schuyot, you met so many religious people. I met all these family religious at least his kids. If I will win the appeal, I'm planning to give seven million dollars to charity. I'm not even fighting it for me. Instead of the money go to these crooks, I will give it out to donation, at least 70% of it. Sounds very interesting. I rip the sky with praise for this guy. When the time came, he won the appeal, how much money he gave me? Not even half a penny. Not even half a penny. Promises and reality usually are not always the same. Did he, did he mean to give the money to charity at the time that he promised from his body language? The answer is yes. You know, I learned body language. I would know right away if he's planning to lie. He actually meant it. But when he got the money, the leech came, the Satan, the Yetzirah, 
grabbed him by his neck and said, no, no, there's other plans for this money. That's the way it is. That's the way it is. So, Rabotai, what you sometimes plan, sometimes it's better that you won't get the money. Because when you had a dream to give this money, if you die without making that money, at least you come with some kind of a credit. That, that's what, that was your dream. Machshava tova, HaKadosh Baruch Hu metzaref lemaaseh. Good intention, Hashem materialize it for you. What happened if you really get the money, most likely you wouldn't give it. Because then the resistance will begin. Right now there's no resistance. The Satan doesn't care you dream. Once you have it and it becomes reality, immediately the Satan begins to attack. So Rabotai, since you know, in the end it's all for good, whatever Hashem does, call man David Rachmana Latav Avid. I'll tell you a story that will make your day. It will really make your day. You know, there's a person in Germany in the time of the war. Few Jews from Germany wanted to escape because they knew if they stay in Germany they'll all get killed. They managed to escape to England. From Germany to England is not far. Somehow they were able to escape Germany and arrive to England. When the actual fighting started between Germany and England, someone in England said, we have too many German citizens that escaped to, to England. How do we know that they are not spies? You cannot leave them here in the country. Let's throw them out of England. But then they say, wow, you're going to send them back to Germany? What if they're not spies? Okay, so let's compromise. We won't send them to Germany, but we don't keep them in England. So where we will send them to? To Australia. Australia, the end of the world. So they put them on a boat with the British flag and each one of them had a suitcase and they sent them with the captain of the boat to Australia. In the middle of the journey, the captain, which is German, is listening on the radio that the Germans are bombing the British and killing them. He hears about his country being destroyed. And all the people on his boat are German citizens. Jews! But what does he care? Germans! He got so angry, he decided to teach them a lesson. What did he do? The only suitcase they have left these people in their life, with the only clothes and some belongings they have, he dumped everything into the water. Without them knowing. They're going to find out when they actually get to the port. When they arrive to Australia, they say, open the tank the, 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 for the suitcases. Say, no, I dumped them all. Or they fail, whatever he say to them. Now they stayed in Australia without anything. Imagine this. You're not, you ran away from your country. The other country threw you out. You arrived to Australia and don't have anything. Just what you're wearing. Nothing. <laughs> Imagine how horrible they felt. Rabotai, many, many years later, they all found out one thing. It took many years to find out. The Germans, they were sinking all British boats. They were killing them. On the, every British boat they sank. They were on the way to sink their boat. Two minutes, the boat would drown with all of them and would die. Just when they were about to drown them, they saw 
Hundreds of suitcases dumped into the water. There was a shock for them. Wait, say, so, wait, don't bomb them. What is this suitcase says? They got curious. Bring them over. They open one. They saw German writings. They open another one. German things. Things from Germany. They said this was German people over, the, on the, over there. Do not bomb this, this boat. They followed that boat all the way to the port of Australia. Out of curiosity, what's going on? British flag and German documents. Let's see what's going on over here. When the people came out of the boat and stood over there, they found out <laughs> that those, the people over there, the German people are already off the boat. The captain turned around and he started to go back to England and what happened? They sunk him and he got what he deserved. But only many years later they found out that the only reason their life got saved is because this Nazi British dumped all their belongings into the water. Now I want to ask you a question. When you saw that the only suitcase you have left in your life were drowning, how easy it was to get angry at Hashem? How many people would take the yarmulke that second and throw it into the water and say, you know what, I'm done with you? Like the famous story that I spoke, that I said hundreds of times, who know by now. Remember the story of Maurice Schechter? Remember, Rabotai, this name, you should never forget that. Remember Maurice Schechter or no? Mr. Greenberg, Greenblatt from London, sitting on a plane from London to Jerusalem. Why? The Ashkenazim bring a big cantor, Hazan, from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur to King David Hotel in Jerusalem, and they come to spend a seret yemet shuvah in Jerusalem together. Slichot, all of that. Chazan, special Chazan. Next to Greenblatt, Maurice Schechter, a secular Jew, sitting next to him. They talked, told him that he's a Holocaust survivor. And he had a son, Chaim, that the Nazis took him over and that's it. He lost his only son. Since then, he finished with him. He left the religion, doesn't want to hear anything about religion. Mr. Greenblatt was trying to convince him to put Philin. Philin is a covenant between Hashem and the Jewish nation, one of the three covenants. He refused. No, I'm done with him, I'm done, that's it. When they arrived to Israel, you know, with the suitcases and the mess over there, he realized he forgot to take his telephone number. He looked for him in a terminal, he's gone. He went to the hotel, he went to his place, Maurice Schechter, on Yom Kippur, Rabotai. He's already 10 days in Israel, it's the Mr. Greenblatt. The Ashkenazim, they do his core. They do the special praise for the souls. So, so those people who their parents are still alive, they go out. They have about 10 minutes break, they go out. The, uh, Mr. Greenblatt say, you know what, let me take a walk a little bit to get some fresh air. He comes out of the hotel, he walked a little bit, well, what does he see? Maurice Schechter is sitting on a bench, eating a sandwich on Yom Kippur. In Jerusalem on the street, Yom Kippur, eating a sandwich. He runs to Maurice Schechter, I cannot believe I meet you again. Oh my God, you again. You eating on Yom Kippur on the street? He said, well, what are you surprised? I told you I'm done with him. That's it. I'm not religious, not even a little bit. Don't talk to me about religion. Listen, Maurice, now it's a great opportunity for you to come say a special prayer for your son. Remember you told me your son, Chaim? Now they're making a special prayer for the souls. Come. Ah, leave me alone. Look at me. I'm not dressed. No, it doesn't matter. Nobody knows you. Nobody cares how you dress. Come, it's a chance now. Since he loved his son very much, you know, his mercy woke up. 
for, for the sandwich, come with me into the synagogue. He took him in, obviously everybody looked at him, who is this guy, came like this, the way he dressed. He said to the Chazan, please do a special prayer for his son. He died in uh, Auschwitz over there. So he said to him, the Chazan, what's the name? He said, Chaim. Chaim Ben? Chaim Ben Morris. Moshe. Morris is Moshe. Chaim Ben Moshe. The Chazan say, Chaim Ben Moshe what? Usually the Chazan don't ask for last name. Chaim Ben Moshe what? Chaim Ben Moshe Shechter. The Chazan look at him and scream, Abba! I'm looking for you for more than 30 years. All over. What happened in the end? Not only the Nazis didn't kill his son, <laughs> he survived with a miracle and became a Talmud Chacham and Hashem gave him a voice. He's the best cantor in the Ashkenazi world. And Maurice Schechter is fighting Hashem for 30 years when in reality all Hashem did for him is only good. Only good. Problem with us is that we refuse to understand that whatever happened to you, the best thing could have happened to you. There's a guy in Israel, he's from Be'er Sheva, from Be'er Sheva. And this guy, he had a very busy day. He goes from Be'er Sheva to Tel Aviv and he has five meetings, business meeting. He made them all in one day. Be'er Sheva, Tel Aviv, it's an hour and a half, two hours ride. In one shot, I'll finish all the meetings. He took all his papers and his phone, and he for, from the bus stop, he took a cab, and he forgot the briefcase in the, in the ca taxi, with all the papers, the, ad the addresses of his meetings, everything. Now he, he's stuck in Tel Aviv, doesn't know where to go. You know, you know that? Imagine you lose your phone, you finish. You don't even know your wife's telephone number today. Everything is programmed in. Right? So what happened? He doesn't know what to do. He only is thinking, where would I get the taxi company and this and that. Finally, after hours, he found the taxi driver. Oh, I didn't know how to reach you. Your phone is ringing here in the taxi and this. I didn't know how to call you. Fine. He came, he picked up his briefcase and he looks at his phone, five missed calls. All of them from the same number. He listens to the voicemail. Hi, Mr. X. This is the principal of your son's yeshiva. Please call me, it's urgent. Wow, what happened? Next message. Hi, this is the principal again. We really need you. Would you please call me? It's urgent. Next message. Hi. I see that you're not responding, so I would have to leave you the message on the phone. We, we went today on a trip, as you know, to the north, and your son went missing. It's already hours. We cannot find him. We really hope nothing happened. Maybe we can fall from a clip. Who knows what? Next message. Why are you not calling back? It's emergency. We need to make decisions what to do. Please call. By now he's about to die already. Fifth message. Baruch Hashem. Your son was found with a little scratch. He fell from, a, from the clip. He rolled a little bit and he couldn't climb back. And we finally found him and... We threw a rope and we picked him up and Baruch Hashem is fine. Everything is fine. So he said to himself, 10 hours of suffering, Hashem shrink that to three minutes. If I had my phone and I would not lose my briefcase and I would be in a meeting now and get that phone call from my principal, how much suffering I would have to go through. My son is somewhere in the north. They, they don't know where he is. I would have to leave the meeting, take a taxi special with panic, 
go all the way to Tveria over there, which will cost him probably hundreds of shekel. Arrive there like crazy, come to the place, run around, sweat, cry, get a heart attack, who knows what else. The wife will drop dead from panic, and in the end they'll find the boy. So how did Hashem help me? It made me lose the briefcase for a few hours. I didn't have the phone. There's two ways to look at life. That's the right way, and that's the wrong way, as you all know. So I just want to finish what I was about to finish with the blood, and we'll finish here. So the blood, the story of the blood, Bnei Israel got wealthy from the blood that they sold to the Egyptian. But we have a problem. The problem is, the Gemara say that you're not allowed to enjoy from a miracle that was done to you. If you do enjoy from it, Hashem is taking away from your credits. Meaning the miracle takes away some of your points, your credit. It's not for free. The Gemara brings a story about Rabbi Elazar Ish Birta. Kadhavu chazu legabait zdakavu tashu mine. Every time he saw collectors, he would run after them and give them every money he has on him. Not like today, when a collector comes, he needs the bathroom. Or he pretends that he davens. Or he gives him a quarter. The Gabaetz Daka, they felt uncomfortable. This, this rabbi, every time he sees us, he runs after us. Take, take! He's not such a rich man. Next time, we will hide from him. When we see him, We'll hide until he pass. So what happened? <laughs> they, they saw him. Right? They call man the ave gave yaivle. Call ma shayalo you would give them. Yom achad avasalik le shuka le mizba ne dunya le birte. One time he went to the market to buy things for his daughter's wedding. Ne dunya. Chazyuhu gabaet tzedakah, the collectors of tzedakah, of charity, saw him. Tashu mineh. They ran away from him. Azal virat batrayu. He started to chase them, to run after them. Amar leo. When they called him, he said, when he called them, he said to them, Amar leo, ashbi'atichu b'mai yaskitu. I make, I make you swear. Tell me the truth. What are you collecting for? They told him, Be'atom ve'yetoma. We marry an orphan with an orphan. Boy and a girl. <laughs> they have no parents to marry them. So we collect money for the wedding. Amar la'em. He said to them, Avodah. I swear. In the name of Hashem. What? Sheem kodmim lebiti. It's more urgent than my own daughter. He was on the way to buy things for his daughter's wedding. Immediately he gave them all the money. All the money. Zaban lech, pash lechad zuza. He left one coin. He gave them everything he had and he left himself a little coin. That's it. Zavan lechiti. He said, you know what, since I have one coin left, what should I do with that? Let me buy wheat. He went, he bought a bunch of wheat. He brought it home. He gave it to his daughter. He said, put it in a basement. Store it in a basement. If we need some bread, we will take those wheat and grind it and make bread. Asik shadiyeh be'achlaba. They put it in a basement. Can Put everything in the basement. Atia le miftach baba de achlaba. They came to open the door. His wife came to open the door of the basement. Chazat achlaba de maliachiti. The whole basement was stuffed with wheat. 
could not open the door. That's how much it was stuck all the way to the ceiling. Everything. The door you couldn't open because of the wheat. As Labirte Lebe Midrasha, his daughter ran to the yeshiva. He was in yeshiva learning. She told him, come see what your lover did for you. Who is your lover? Hashem. Come see what your lover did for you. He came and he saw what happened. He said, I swear, I make a vow. All of that is for the poor people that need bread. Don't touch it, he said to his family. Rashi says, this is Gmarayin Masechet Tanit, page 24. Rashi said, Lo ratza leenot min anes, he didn't want to enjoy the miracle, kedei shelo yenaku lo mishuyotav. That Hashem will not deduct from his merit in the next world, which is eternal. Based on this Gemara, why the nation of Israel enjoyed the miracle with the water that turned into blood and made millions over the Egyptians? Why they are not afraid that this miracle that they are using to make money now will take away from the reward in the next world? You understand the question or no? Who thinks he knows the answer? There are two answers to this question. Every question has an answer. Sometimes we know it, sometimes we don't. But there is an answer always. No? What do you think? So the answer is, it's not the same. When a miracle is done to you personally, then it takes away from your merit. Yes. Hashem use your credit to interfere with the laws of nature and save you from unbelievable, misfortunate situation. But a nation, a, a miracle to the entire nation of Israel, it's not a miracle for each individual. It's a miracle for a nation. That's not taking away from their merits. Also, there is another answer to it. When the Jews had the water in their hand, what was it? Water. When the Egyptians took it, what was it? Blood. The miracle here was done with the Jews or was done with the, with the Egyptians? The Egyptians. The Jews had water before and had water after. All alone they had water. Nothing changed in their water. The miracle that Hashem did was against the Egyptians. It wasn't a miracle for the Jew. That Hashem turned the water of the Egyptians into blood. So the miracle was to the Egyptian. The Jews indirectly enjoyed what happened to the Egyptians. That's their punishment. If I benefit from an enemy of the Jewish nation's punishment, doesn't take away my merit. But he gets what he deserves. If I happen to enjoy from it, directly, indirectly, why not? It's not a private miracle for me. It's Hashem is showing to the Egyptians how wicked they are and what's going to be their end. And that was only the beginning. Why the first attack was with blood? And why attacking their Nile? Because they worship the Niles. They believe it's their God. He keeps coming up and gives water to the rest of Egypt. They made tunnels. And the water goes through the tunnel to all the fields. Every time the water went up, it slides, spill into the tunnels, into the paths. So therefore they thought, this Egyptian, that this is God. Every time he gives us more water and life. So they bow down to the, to the Nile. So Hashem right away attacked their God. First attack their God. Later attack their second God, which was the sheep. And told the Jews, take their gods and tie it to the bed. And keep it there four days. And drive them crazy. Mentally. When they ask, why are you taking all the goats? Why are you taking all the sheep? Why all of a sudden each one of you bought one? What's happening here? You didn't leave us with any goats, any sheep. Oh, we're going to turn your God into a good steak. And we're going to eat it and pass overnight. Imagine now you go to a church, anywhere, 
anywhere you want, in America. Go on a roof, they have a big wood cross over there. <laughs> you take a saw. <laughs> well, hey, what are you doing? Police, call 911. What? You don't need 911. Before the police will arrive, there are going to be 300 people coming. What? Religious Jews coming the cross from the church. Ah, with the guns, with fire. Ah, in one minute, <laughs> you won't have a body left. I don't have to tell you what they're going to do to him. Imagine now the Jew stands in their face. Ladies and gentlemen, before you get angry, I would like to teach you a lesson today. You all idol worshippers and you worship nonsense. So today we're going to give you lesson number one. This first thing I burn. Then I'm going to make a good steak on that grill. And all of you will watch me eat your gut. What will happen to you? <laughs> Before you finish the first sentence, they will finish 5,000 bullets on you. Or rocks, or whatever it's going to be. This was a very big test in Emuna. Are you trusting me or no? Hashem said to the Jews. Take the goats, take the sheep in the face of these Egyptians, as much as they hate you, Walk with that with a leash, tie it to your bed, and tell them, get ready. The big barbecue is about to begin. Fourth and July barbecue. Actually, in America, it's Memorial Day, no? When do they barbecue? Fourth and July or Memorial? Fourth and July, I understand why the barbecue, but why in Memorial Day, when so many soldiers die, they make a party? They eat hot dogs. What's the connection? I don't understand. Rabotai, to conclude, the, the life of a person has a lot of miracles. Most of them you're not aware of. You're not aware of. Do not count on the miracle. Don't push yourself to a place that you're going to need a miracle. Don't be overconfident. Meaning, don't put yourself in a place of danger. Don't go to bad neighborhoods in the middle of the night. Don't go with a fancy car into a poverty area when there's a lot of crimes and a lot of drug addicts and robbers and who knows, gangs. Do not trigger, do not wake up the bear. Don't go next to one to semite with your fancy schmancy watch and who knows, fancy clothes. When you're some kind of a successful Jew in a business or in a bank or you own a business or you own a firm, be down to earth. Do not attract more hate. The hate exists. Do not double it. Do not triple it. Because in the end, you're going to die for it. Even if you don't deserve to die. And then Hashem will blame you for your debt. It's partially committing suicide. Partially. And as you know, you're not allowed to commit suicide. Tomorrow my lecture will be, will start about the mistake of people that commit suicide when, when life is not as they expected it to be. I'm going to bring all the sources, what's going to happen to these people, how severe is this foolish act? And we will we'll take it from there, Bezrat Hashem. Until then, we'll see you tomorrow in Brooklyn. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen. Rabbi Hananiah ben Akashia Omer. Ratzah, Kadosh Baruch Hu, Lezakot et Yisrael.